Hello and welcome to the Dash Trader Newsroom. This is the inflation update and looking ahead to the annual earnings results. My name is Michael DeJore. I'm Director of Educational Services here at Dash Trader, and I'm also a licensed professional. So let's just jump right in and talk a little bit about inflation. So inflation has hit a 40-year high. That means it's the highest it's, it's been since... Um, uh, 1982, uh, being as that it's 19, uh, it's 2022 this year. So the inflation has not been this high since 1982. Um, what will the long-term effects be on the stock markets and the U.S. financial markets? Um, let's just go over what uh, effect inflation has in general. So generally, inflation hurts technology stocks. Um, more so than uh, value stocks and kind of uh, industrial stocks. So small, uh, uh, small companies, um, companies listed on the Russell, for instance, um, the Russell 2000 index, uh, we're going to take a look at the Russell 2000 index today. Um, those companies get affected the worst. Why? Because they generally borrow more money. They're more reliant on loans. And um, because they have uh, more loans outstanding and they don't necessarily have quite as good cash positions as some of the bigger tech companies um, and bigger industrial companies, they tend to um, are much tend to be much more in, uh, uh, in interest rate sensitive. So if inflation stays high for a prolonged period of time, um, what will generally happen is that the Fed will be forced to uh, raise interest rates. So you'll see, start to see technology companies start to sell off, small cap companies like those listed on small and mid cap companies like on the Russell uh, 2000, those will start to sell off and you'll start to see money flow into um, some big names that are value names, companies that are undervalued. Um, so definitely keep a eye on value stocks going into 2022. All right. So. In other news, we had uh, federal uh, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell um, had his reconfirmation hearing um, in Congress. Uh, what should we expect from the Federal Reserve in 2022? I think it's pretty much um, accepted that we're going to have anywhere between three and four um, interest rate hikes in 2022. Um, so we're kind of uncertain whether it's going to be three interest rate hikes or four interest rate hikes. Um, pretty much all the Fed governors are now turning from being dovish to hawkish, meaning, and, and what that means is dovish means that they don't um, want to constrict monetary policy, um, and most of them have decidedly gone hawkish across the board. Even the most dovish Fed, um, uh, Fed, governor, um, get Fed governors have turned hawkish. So we, we've seen a very, very big change from the position of Jerome Powell uh, last year when he wasn't reconfirmed and reinstated to this year where he is reconfirmed. He's been reinstated. Inflation is a massive, massive problem. I mean, let's not um, pull punches here. Inflation is the problem it is because of the very, very lax monetary policy of the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, when you have this much stimulus, when you overstimulate a market, a market can get a little bit frothy. And certainly the markets have gotten frothy. That tends to create inflation. So we, we have this very, very strong um, kind of almost um, certainly not transitory. Let's just put it that way. This certainly not transitory inflation problem. And there's only one way to resolve uh, an inflation problem such as the one we're dealing with which is to raise interest rates and to cut monetary policy. Um, we also hear now that Fed governors are talking about not just tapering, but offloading or selling and reducing the size of the $9 trillion balance sheet that the Federal Reserve has accumulated. So the Federal Reserve over the last you know, 10 years, 12 years, has accumulated $9 trillion of assets there's two ways that they can deal with those assets. One way is they can let those assets kind of burn off over time, which is pretty much what they've been doing. Or if they have over purchased assets, they will have to sell those assets in order to um, 
uh, to, to reduce their balance sheet and to constrict uh, monetary policy further. Um, many, I mean, pretty much the, um, you know, the, the, the testimony was that, you know, uh, Jerome Powell believes that he can fend off inflation without crushing the, lo- the job market. Um, to be totally honest with you, I'm not so sure that that can be done um, because we've not seen inflation like this since the early 1980s. And generally, when you have um, a Fed that's raising interest rates um, and the inflation has gone as far, the inflation problem has gone as far as it has, um, it's very hard for the, um, the markets to kind of shrudge it off, um, you know, as it was, was discussed yesterday and the day before in the, um, the reconfirmation hearings. So, so it'll be a very, very interesting and most likely more volatile year um, going into 2022 um, than the market conditions that we've seen in the past. And certainly today's market action um, was a little bit of a testimony to that as the volatility index was on the rise. We're going to take a look at the VIX. We're going to take a look at the UVXY. We're going to take a look at the VIXN, VIXN, which is the NASDAQ's um, volatility index. Um, and we're, we're going to take a look at some of these um, various uh, market indicators and, and see what they're telling us. All right. So let's talk a little bit about earnings season. So we have earnings season coming up. So companies will start to announce their annual results. What should we look forward to um, as the markets are forward looking? So, uh, you know, from my perspective, over the last two years, we've seen a tremendous growth in technology companies, um, any company that was uh, a work from anywhere company, um, a digital marketing company, a company that had a digital element to it, a subscriber element to it, such as Netflix. Um, you know, many of these companies have already started to go down. Um, and we, we really um, have seen a very big shift um, from these companies that, that really could do no wrong during the pandemic. Um, but now you have to realize that markets tend to be forward looking and now we're looking forward, really how much better can companies earnings be than what has already happened in the past? For instance, a company like Amazon, okay, Amazon is a massive home delivery, um, online retailer, um, with inflation increasing, Amazon's profit margins tend to be, you know, 10, 12%. Inflation is now 7% last year. It's very hard for a company like Amazon, which operates on thin, thin margins, to compensate for 7% inflation when you only have 12% profit margins. So what happens is, is that whatever past benefit Amazon got, whatever past um results that Amazon got, those results are in the past. The markets tend to be forward looking. Um, for instance, you know, Netflix, they've added millions upon millions of subscribers. They have great content. If that's all in the past, that's already baked into the price of Netflix. So it's really hard for Netflix to wow anybody with their results because they've had such phenomenal results over the past two years. So it's almost like um, many of the companies are setting themselves up. They, they had some great performance, but the best times are behind them, not ahead of them. And I think that that's probably going to be the tone of the earnings season and the annual results season this year. So with that being said, I'm just going to, um, to jump to the charts real quick. Just give me a few moments to um, bring up my DAS trader here. So hopefully you're seeing my DAS trader here. I'm just going to bring up the S&P chart for today. This is the chart of the S&P um, SPY, which tracks the, the, um, the S&P 100. And I mean, it, it really is hard to look at this chart and, and feel good from a technical perspective. You have a high a failure to make a new high. You have a low. It did not make a lower low. So this low right here did not take out that low. So from a technical perspective, um, you know, you have a high, a failure to make a new high. And what that usually leads to is it should make a lower low. 
Um, a lower low means that we, we at least retest the 456 level and potentially um, go down to the 452 level. And if you break the 452 level, the next level down is, is 434. So, you know, this is, this is pretty much the, the long and the short of it as far as the markets go. Um, you know, we've been a very, very prolonged uptrend. We had one pretty significant pullback in October. Um, but then, you know, now we really have not had any significant pullback. We are just about um, 40, to, uh, 40 points on the, off the high on the SPY, um, which is about 10%. That is a normal, um, healthy correction, um, but but I would expect that we're probably going to pull back further, as this is very much a shoulder, head, and now shoulder, with really a weak right shoulder. Um, I'm just going to add in some of the momentum indicators because when you add in the momentum indicators on this chart, it it also gives you a little bit of a more interesting view here. So, I mean, you look at the momentum indicators on this daily chart and you see a divergence on the CCI high, very, very overbought, less overbought, less overbought, um, but certainly now getting into the point where it could potentially be very bearish. You look at the MACD here, the MACD has the signal lines have crossed over. And this is just starting a move. It has not even gone negative below the histogram yet. You can see how long, when you're in a long uptrend, how long the signal line can stay above the histogram. This is just starting a momentum move to the downside. So you price is now below all major moving averages. And um, you know this is not a healthy uh, market in any way, shape, or form. Uh, this is a start of some kind of correction activity. Um, let's take a look at the QQQ, which represents the NASDAQ 100. Um, now, the the rally, let's just go in here and take a look at the daily. The ra Let's actually look at the weekly. I mean, this is the rally on the QQQ, okay? Price has been above its 10, 20, and 50 period moving average for a really long time. Um, I mean, look at how high the signal line is away from the histogram on the MACD. So it's very, very uncommon for price to get that completely out of whack um, between the momentum indicators and the, the price chart. So when you, you see something like that, you say, okay, there's, there's something going on here. When I bring on this um, high, high, failure to make a new high, failure to make a new high, failure to break above the moving averages get knocked down completely. And you can see we got into the moving averages and we got completely knocked down. Um, if we take out the low at 370, you know, 350, here we come on the NASDAQ. And it doesn't matter what the earnings results are. If the entire market is overvalued, then the entire market will have to be pro appropriately valued. And, um, Let's take a look at the DIA because I think it's probably the strong man at this point. It made a high, failure to make a new high. It, it is not below its moving averages. However, it did have a pretty bearish day and um, could potentially go lower. Um, but it needs to, it has a lot more support than the other major indexes. And again, this goes back to that how do markets deal with inflation? And the, the most negative market in terms of dealing with uh, interest rates and inflation is the small caps and the mid caps. And if you look at the small caps and the mid caps, I mean, this very clearly is a bear flag formation. This is a move down. Here is a bear flag. I mean, the IWM is about to break down um, in, in a bear flag formation. And so the IWM, which represents the Russell 2000, um, is a bear flag. That is clearly the weakest. The QQQ is a high failure to make a new high, rejection below the moving averages. When price goes below the moving averages, I, I mean, I'll tell you, with the exception of here and here, 
price has not been below the moving averages for any length of time on the NASDAQ in two years. So we have a literally a two year, very, very pronounced rally um, that could potentially implode. You could see the momentum indicators are now trending below. And of course, we know why the rally was, was in effect. The, the rally was created by stimulus from both the US government and stimulus from the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, that stimulus is being withdrawn. The Fed is no longer supporting the market the way that it was. The Fed governors have turned from being dovish to hawkish. The uh, Jerome Powell's no longer worried about his job. He's got his job. He's been reinstated. He's got nothing to worry about. And of course, that that's the reason for the change in tone. And um, let's take a look at, so we've gone through the QQQ, we've gone through the SPY, we've gone through the IWM, and we've gone through the DIA. Let's take a look at Bitcoin, um, which is GBTC, which is the tracking stock that represents Bitcoin. Now, this Bitcoin made a huge run up. It made a secondary run up. It failed to make a higher high. And now it's kind of down here at support. Um, I think that you have a little bit of a relief rally um, in store for Bitcoin short term, as it's kind of gotten very, very bearish. But um, probably, you know, the way things look, if the U.S. dollar strengthens, Bitcoin is denominated against U.S. dollars. The U.S. dollar would strengthen because if the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, that will only serve to strengthen the U.S. dollar. If the Congress no longer passes any stimulus because the economy is overstimulated, as we can see from inflation, then you will see that the only thing that will most likely happen is that the dollar will strengthen. Bitcoin is denominated against U.S. dollars. That means as the dollar strengthens, Bitcoin gets weaker. Um, that is not a, a good thing for Bitcoin. Let's take a look at Ethereum e as represented by the ETHA. Um, here is Ethereum. It's a little bit better than Bitcoin, um, but, but certainly um, it has a very similar chart. It's below its moving averages. It's kind of holding out here at $29.67. So certainly Ethereum is a little bit better than Bitcoin, but certainly not doing great either. Um, let's take a look at some of the big stocks like Apple. So Apple started going down today uh, pretty significantly. So you have a high, failure to make a new high, failure to make a new high. Well, this is a high, new high, failure to make a new high. Um, Apple and all the big tech companies like Apple, MSFT, they make up a huge percentage of the indexes. And really, the indexes have already been going down based on the small to medium-sized companies, as we can see by the W, uh, the IWM. But when you, when, now that the big companies like Apple, Facebook, NFLX, Netflix, now that you see the big companies like Netflix are going down, Apple are going down, Microsoft's going down, CSCO, which is another big cap on the. Um, you know, on the NASDAQ, it's just Cisco. They have a you know, very, very large market capitalization. Um, so now that you see that these other big cap tech companies are going down, they make up a huge percentage of the index and they're going to start to draw, drag down the rest of the index. Let's take a look at some of the other companies that make up like IBM. IBM. IBM still hanging in there. So again, these companies are perceived a little bit more as a value, like Ford, Ford's doing well. So like you could see how money is flowing from technology and flowing in the direction of value. So look at Ford, look at GM, very similar, not going down. Look at X, X, uh, X is US Steel. So you'll see that technology companies and growth companies are the place that have a little bit more risk. And, um, and then you see companies that kind of have seen not so much love in the past couple of years um, get doing a little better. One place that tends to do really well in, in a rising interest rate environment are companies like BAC, Bank of America. 
JPM, bank, you know, JP Morgan. Why do uh, banks tend to do well in rising interest rate environments? Because you know, conceptually, if um, if you are you know getting lent money at a cheap rate and then lending it out for a more dear rate. Um, and interest rates are going up, you can lend the money out for even more. And you can say the person has bad credit and this condition, that condition, you can sell them points to get cheaper interest rates. That generally creates more money in the direction of fees for banks and financial institutions. Um, small, medium-sized banks um, also have a tendency to do well. So, um, so just keep an eye out on banks and financials as they are one area that as interest rates rise, they tend to make money um, in a rising interest rate environment because they can make money by selling points and 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 of course just marking up the cheap money that's lent to them from the bank, from the central bank, and then they lend it out to us at a more dear rate. So that's one area. Um, certainly, when it comes into earnings season, keep an eye that banks tend to do really really well in rising interest rate environments. Um, technology companies don't do well in rising interest rate environments. Um, value companies do do well. So companies that are undervalued, um, IR, Ingersoll Rand, right? This company, no sell-off at all. It's going sideways. Ingersoll Rand makes air conditioning compressors, right? I mean, probably don't, they don't see a lot of love under normal circumstances, but Ingersoll Rand is a company that that may do really, really well um, in the next couple of months because, yeah, their industry is not too sexy or interesting or boring, but they do make money and they are a good value. And people need air conditioning uh, uh, compressors, you know, regardless of what the, uh, the economy is doing. Um, you know, Procter and Gamble certainly has had a nice run. You know, they're they're kind of like a consumer cyclical company. Um, Remember, value companies tend to do well in rising interest rate environments in inflationary times. Tech companies, um, small to medium-sized tech companies, startups, anybody who borrows a lot of money or relies on interest rates, those companies get put under pressure. Companies that are old, established value companies, probably boring companies like WD-40, right? WD is uh, WD-40. Um, you know, they've done great. They're probably pretty resistant. People are going to buy WD-40 regardless of what happens in the world, right? And they need to lubricate their door or their engine or whatever the case is. So just going into earnings season, I would say this is a great time to think defensively. And uh, let's take a look at volatility because this is going to be pretty fun. VXX. Um, we could see today that the VXX had a really big spike to the upside. We have a double bottom on the VXX. The VXN, Vixen, v, v -N -X. let's see if that's right. No, no, it says VXX. We'll just do that. So here's the VXX. Here is the VIX. Let's see that. Yeah, VIX. So here's the VIX and the v, VXX. Both of them have had a pretty significant move to the upside. UVXY is another one of these volatility indexes. Also had a pretty significant move to the upside. Um, when you start to see volatility, the volatility indexes moving up, that's generally not a good sign for calm, quiet markets. Um, that's, you know, you can see that back in October, um, the UVXY got all the way up to 26. We're only at 12.57 right now. Um, you know, certainly the market is not as low as it was in October, but if we get back to where we were in October, expect the VXX or the UVXY to be back where it was in October. Um, and again, according to the momentum indicators like the CCI and the, the MACD, um, the RSI, all of these indicators are just saying that this things are starting to, are just starting to move down. Not that this move is near reversal or completed. Um, the start of a potential correction is what it's indicating, not that this correction is already near its bottom. 
So just be aware of that. Remember, the Fed indicated that it will start to raise interest rates in March, yet the market is potentially selling off now in the middle of January. So be aware that markets tend to be forward looking, like the market will sell off way before March. It will factor in whatever interest rate hike way before we ever get the interest rate hike. Okay, there's an old expression, sell the rumor and buy the news, right? Or uh, um, you know, is it buy the rumor, sell the news? Yeah, buy the rumor, sell the news. Um, so you really want to be in this case, it's it's um, sell the rumor and 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 buy the news. Um, so it's kind of opposite because the market's already pretty extensively up. And again, if you have profits, the best thing you can do is really to protect your profits and um, and really have cash available because the U.S. dollar um, should appreciate if interest rates are going higher. So I think that's enough of the charts. All right, stay up to date um, with all things DAS by signing up for our monthly newsletter and emails. Simply fill out the form at the bottom of our webpage at www.dastrader. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel, DAS Trader TV and the DAS Newsroom Reminders. Follow us on all of our social media outlets. Um, that is uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, just a reminder that you know, the U.S. markets will be closed and the DAS office will be closed on Monday, 117, in observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Our office will open again on Tuesday, 118, and we are all wish we are all wishing you a very happy and healthy holiday weekend um, from all of uh, us here at DAS Trader. So have a great Martin Luther King Jr. holiday weekend. See you all in two weeks.